Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this talk. This is a very basic talk on functional programming and what that even means. Um, so before we get started a bit about me, I'm Saif. Uh, you can just call me Saif from National University of Singapore. I'm here on a school day. I'm, I'm still studying for my final semester. And on the right, you can see the kinds of stuff that I do in school uh, usually. Uh, that's actually from my first year in university. So that's, uh, that's quite cool. Um, in the meantime, I've also been an ex data platform engineer at Dallas Urban Real Systems, where I worked with uh, MRT data, a lot of MRT data. And right now, uh, where I am is uh, Clinify, uh, a software engineer there. It's a health tech startup, um, just a regular software engineer there. So enough about me. Um, the talk is about really four uh, basic things, you know, the principles of functional programming, uh, the benefits and gotchas of functional programming. It's not all uh, roses like people, some people say. Um, I'll have some tips about functional programming in real life, and I'll point you to uh, where to go next if, if you're really intrigued. Um, so, so before we begin the entire talk, uh, there is one thing I want you to keep in mind, which is uh, this quote by Harold Abelson. Um, he is one of the co-authors of SICP, uh, the coveted computer algorithms book, which is programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. Um, and as software engineers, we often forget that where, when we're under time pressure and stuff, you know, we have to get some things done. Uh, we'll take a, think about maintainability and testing and all that stuff later. We just have to get this done. Um, and, and that's understandable. But I want you to keep this in mind as the goal uh, when we're going through this entire talk. Um, so when you first hear about functional programming on the web, uh, and it's all hype these days, you know, you hear about these words, uh, monoids, monads, type classes, higher order functions, partial application, carrying functors, and it's like, uh, you know, super confusing and super scary. So this talk is really about uh, a quick overview of functional programming. Uh, it takes months, if not years to master. So it's really a quick overview. So if, if you already know functional programming, it might be a review uh, for you. Uh, if, if I'm saying something wrong because I'm still learning, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and uh, tell me so. But the goal really is to inspire you to go try it out after this talk, right? Uh, I'll try to keep it short and sweet. Uh, so firstly, the principles of functional programming. Forget about all those words I just said um, and think about these two, two things. The first principle of functional programming is that you only write pure functions. And I'll talk about what that means soon. But basically, it means you do not have any side effects of, from function. And we all know what pure functions are because those are the first functions we've written when we started learning programming. The second thing, which is kind of related, uh, is immutability. It means that no state must be modified. And this is where people get super confused. Like all of our programs are kind of state machines. And if you can't change states, what, that, what does that even mean? Um, so yeah, we, we'll go through it. It's actually quite not that difficult. It's, it's very simple things. So firstly, a pure function. Uh, so so I, I took this example from a talk that I saw on YouTube. Um, and, and feel free to type on the chat or unmute yourself if, if you want. I have this uh, bit of Python code that says y equals 1. And then z equals some function with an input parameter of 5. Uh, what is y after I call this function? So most of you would say y is 1, which is completely understandable. That's what common sense says. But what if the function looked like this? It says global y, take that y, add 1, and then return 1. So now z equals 2, y equals 2, even though y does not even appear in the in the statement at all. Now, wait, that's like horrible code. If someone wrote that code, I'd fire them. What about now? 
this is the kind of code you see a lot. Self dot y plus equals one. But it's not really that non-standard. It's something I would write even one year back. Uh, now, what if the function was like this? The function is very easy, uh, a very simple function. It takes an x, returns an x plus one. So if we put use that function here, y is still one, z is six, right? Now, this is not really a complicated function. And this is the kind of functions you've written when you first started programming. And that's at the heart of function programming. Don't write these kinds of functions. Write functions that are pure, that have no side effects, right? So a function must not have any side effect. Now, now, this is just formalizing what you just saw in that example, which means it must not change anything outside of its own context. Uh, so going back here, the context of this function is x. So it can only change stuff inside, but it can't affect anything outside. And y is outside of it. Um, the second thing is, no matter how many times you call this function, it should give you back the same answer if you give it the same output. Again, if you go back to this, if you call this function 10 times, it'll give you 10 different answers, even if you're calling it with an X, right? If you call this function 10 times, it'll give you 10 different answers. But if you're calling this functions, function 10 times, it'll always give you the same answer if you're calling it with the same parameters. So what happens is the functions become super easy to read and to prove. Uh, and very easy to unit test because all you need to do to test this function is hectoparameter parameter and then it'll give you some output. Doesn't matter when you call this function, where you call this function, um, it only matters what you call this function with as input parameters. And it becomes I, very easy to maintain. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, I yeah. had a question. So it, sure, it, sure, it feels like it, it follows more of the mathematical definition of one one function. Okay. Exactly. Uh, so a function in maths is something that takes an input and gives you an output all the time. It maps to one output, right? And that's exactly what uh, function programming is. Uh, the rules of function programming, as you'll see later, is in lambda calculus, which is heavily inspired by theoretical mathematics. And function programming dates back to, I think, almost 1930s, 1940s, before we even had those computers. Uh, so it's really just a pure mathematical function which is what is super neat about this. Now, a lot of people might be thinking, hey, like, sounds good, but too theoretical. Apparently not. Uh, I'm not a front end programmer, but I've dabbled a bit in a React and Redux uh, this past month. And most of React and Redux is purely functional. Uh, and and you, when you write React code and Redux code, the best way to write it is in uh, functional terms with pure functions, right? Uh, the second principle of functional programming is immutability. Now, if you're sharp, the first thing you'll notice is, hey, if I write a for loop, what do I write? For int i equals zero, i less than some number, i plus plus. So every loop, I'm actually mutating the i. The i is changing every loop. And if you do something with the i inside, there's going to be a side effect. So you can't really write for loops and while loops in functional programming. Now, uh, if you've never done functional programming, again, I didn't do functional programming for most of my life. I'm like, wait, for loops are the first thing I learned in, functional, uh, in, in programming languages. How can I not use for loops? So in the next few slides, I'm going to show you a few ways to uh, get rid of that loop idea and use some other constructs that are more native to functional languages. Uh, so first, an example, I have a pure function here, which takes in a number and adds one to it and returns that to you. Pure function, completely pure. I have a list. Again, like I said, it's not that you cannot have states. It's just that you cannot change states. So this list is a state. You can't change this list, which means you can't really do anything on that list, right? So if I want to do something in a procedural way, we have to do a new uh, we have to declare a new list called result. And if I want to add one to everything in this list, I'm just going to do result.append increment by one num 
uh, and do a for loop. This is the way most of us would write programs. In a functional way, you would call this function map. Give it the function that you want it to apply. And apply is a word you'll see very often in functional programming. Uh, apply this function to every element of this list. Same idea. Uh, you have a function. You're doing one thing to every um, element of the list. And that's what you get result. So this looks super concise. Uh, once you start doing functional programming, you stop thinking in for loops and you start thinking in maps. So again, a uh, super simple function. Now, uh, immutability in some functional program, uh, mean languages, are so strict that they don't let you mutate stuff. If you have an x equals 1, in the next line, you cannot say x equals 2. And that's for programs like Haskell, programming languages like Haskell or OCaml. But in Python, you can still do it. So Python, even if you're writing uh, functional programs, you can do these kinds of things that are not really allowed in other functional programming languages. Now, JavaScript has this module extension called immutable.js that you can always use as types to not do mutable stuff. So your function, uh, your program remains functional. Um, another example is filter. So I want to filter all the numbers here in this list that are even. To do that in a procedural way, just write is even and append it if it's true. In a functional way, you just call this function, a native function called filter. Give it the Boolean function that gives you true or false and give it the list and it filters it. Really the same kind of thing, just a new function to use. Now, the first thing you notice here, if you notice is the idea that a function is a first class citizen, which means a function is an object as well. The same way we can pass a, a list or a variable to a function, we can pass one function to another function for to, as a parameter, right? So filter here is a higher order function that takes in another function. And fun is even here is a function that is, uh, you see the power of first order functions here as well. Again, uh, something I wanted to point out, this sounds like very technical stuff, but that's all it really is, right? Uh, final example for immutability is reduce. So another thing we do very often when you're first learning to program is you have a list of numbers, add them all up. What we do is we have a counter and we loop through it and uh, you know add it to the counter every loop, perfectly fine. Again, you don't have for loops in functional programming uh, languages. So what you do is use something called reduce. Now reduce takes an initial value and just adds it in, adds, uh, takes in an initial value, it takes in a function to use on your list. So just say the initial value here was zero and then just add one, two, three elements in and then finally give you one value as a result. The same thing, that's it. That's kind of all you need to know about functional programming in what, uh, not a lot of minutes, right? 10 minutes. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out is the use of a Lambda function here. So we've all heard Lambdas, Lambdas everywhere. Um, but essentially what is what it is, you can think of it as an anonymous function that takes in two parameters and gives you back one pure result. Uh, so functional programming comes with, those are the principles. I teach you Jana Lagbana to do functional programming, but it comes with a few bells and whistles that everyone in functional programming languages use. The first one is lambdas. I don't need to like elaborate a lot here. Uh, you can see here is a lambda calculus expression. I don't know lambda calculus myself, uh, but lambda, this is the origin of lambda functions, essentially. Um, another thing we see a lot is tail recursion in functional programming. Uh, so let's let's look at an example because this is quite interesting. Like you don't think about it, uh, even though like I'm not recursion Jani, we don't think about tail recursion in that way. So think about a uh, factorial function. How would you write it? Uh, however you write it, factorial um, n equals, you know, n times factorial n minus one and then recurs or so on. 
what happens is in functional languages, you write something called fold left. So fold left basically folds your list from left to right. It takes in one function. The function is the multiply function, one initial value, and then the list it uses it on. So it's gonna do one times whatever it happens. So one times two, two times whatever, three times whatever, and so on. So in a recursive way, uh, this is what happens. You write factorial X and then you say six times factorial five, four times whatever. And you keep doing that. And then you hit the base case. Once you hit the base case, it starts returning and so on. And it uses the stack, uses the stack, right? In a functional way, you don't really do that. What you do is use the accumulator itself. You call factorial six. It says, okay, I'm going to multiply one times one and give it to the next one. Uh, so this one really does not need to exist anymore because it's done with this work. This one says one times one, give it back. And this one says, okay, the next one is two, one times two, give it to the next one, two times three, six, give it to the next one and so on until you hit seven. Once you hit seven, just give this back. So you don't really have to go back here and then return the thing. Now this is quite neat because number one, it's faster. You don't have to do stack management. Even the OS does not have to do stack management because you're using the same stack frame over and over again. But the second one is most important. You never have stack overflows. So I think it's in this link. Someone tried to do factorial with uh, Python, the normal recursive way and the tail recursive way, I think, in Python. What is the maximum n you can hit before your uh, program crashes? it's apparently around 980. So you do factorial 980 in this way, your program crashes. This one does not crash at all because it's using constant space and it's faster. So this is something as well you see a lot in, uh, in uh, functional programming languages. Uh, here's a comic from XKCD, which, which is like super tongue in cheek. And it says, why do you like functional programming so much? And we say tail recursion is its own reward. And it really is like super satisfying when you can write a function in a tail recursive way. Like you feel like you have a big brain and stuff, you know? Uh, I'm only half kidding. Uh, another thing you see a lot in functional programming is this idea of laziness. Um, so let's see, how can I annotate stuff? Yeah, so here we have, uh, Fibonacci sequence, and you, you remember Fibonacci is 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and so on. So what this is telling you is it is giving you an infinite list of Fibonacci numbers. And to do that, uh, to execute that line, you need like a few nanoseconds or, or a few, yeah, a few microseconds at max, right? Why? Because it's not really calculating an infinite list of Fibonacci number. It can't, right? Because we have limited space. We have finite space in our memory. So what this number is telling you is a Fibonacci sequence starts with a zero, a one, and the rest of it is a recursive definition until infinity. So what's the tails of Fibonacci means anything except the head. So think about uh, fibs is an array of zero, one, and then I don't know what else. It's a lazy thing. And to get the what else, you just add zip width, a plus, and a tails of the people of this itself. So its tail is starting with one, right? So to get the third element, what do you do? Zero plus one, one. Now I know that the second element is of the tail is one. And this is the tail, right? one. So what is the uh, fourth element? It's one plus one, two. So I know the tail is now two. What is the fifth element? Three. So I know the tail is now three. What is the uh, next element? Five, because these two add to five. So I know the tail is now five. What is the next element? Eight and so on. So what this says is, I don't know what this is, but when I get this, I can add it to this and then keep doing that. And in functional languages, you call this a tank, right? So when you execute this function, uh, sorry, this, this uh, declaration, it doesn't know what the third element is. It says it's a tank 
And to get the third element, you have to do this, but it doesn't do it, right? When you say, hey, give me back Fibonacci, the fifth Fibonacci, it'll do it then. You say, give me back the hundred Fibonacci, it'll do everything in between and then give the result back to you. So there is this kind of inherent laziness in functional languages. And that's really powerful because uh, you can use first, you can use infinite streams, you can use infinite lists, which is super powerful. Uh, and laziness is sometimes way faster than non-lazy types of applications. Um, so this is a powerful uh, feature and in JavaScript, they have something called Lodash, which is again, an addition on the language where if you use it, then your uh, calculations become lazy. Now, when your calculations become lazy, instead of doing uh, five calculations on one 1000 length array five times, so, you know, it's oh, n times five, so 5000 operations, you don't really need to do that. If you just want the fifth one, you just do five operations on it. Uh, you also see this, I understand most of you are probably data scientists or data engineers. Uh, Apache Spark is completely lazy. I forgot what the first one was, but essentially before you call collect, you can just keep adding stuff. And then when you call collect, it gives you the results. And that's when it becomes a bit slower, right? So Spark is super lazy as well. Uh, another thing you see a lot in functional programming languages is something called currying. So I'll give you a JavaScript example. I'm trying to keep away from Haskell because I understand most of you don't, don't know that, of course, otherwise you wouldn't be in this talk. Uh, so if you have a function called multiply, it takes two parameters. Now, if you want to write another function that says multiply with two only, whatever you give, you return a function that says multiply two. So here you've applied the first one already and then you can just give it the second one. So here multiply two means two times four and eight. This is called partial application of functions or currying, which is also something very useful in functional programming and uh, programming languages and widely used. Um, in Python, it's not very easy, but it's still possible. Python has this uh, module called func tools, uh, which has a lot of functional things because Python inherently is not functional. So they put this addition on the language that you can use. So you can use this partial fu uh, function to make partial functions, right? Uh, kind of neat. Um, another thing that is super nice for data engineers is this thing about piping. So as data engineers, we always use pipelines, right? Um, so this thing about composition uh, in function languages is you want to do a certain set of things like a pipeline on one value. And if you're in a language like Python, what you would do is something like this, like double five and then double and then increment and then double. I mean, it's not super unreadable, but like all these uh, closing brackets start getting like, you know, not fun. In functional languages, what you can have is a pipeline operator. And this says, okay, take five, double it, double it again, increment something, double it again. And it's the same thing as this. And it literally looks like a pipeline. What the language actually does is composes the, these functions first, I think. I, I'm not sure about JavaScript, but for Haskell, this is what happens. It composes these functions first to create one function and then uh, applies that function to five and gets the result, which is composition and piping. Again, like super neat in functional languages. Um, and again, if you're a data engineer, Apache Flink, uh, Flint and GraphX from Spark is something that should ring in your mind because this is exactly what they do as well, just piping uh, and, and stuff. Functional languages, I think this is the last one, hopefully, uh, for bells and whistles, have a very strong typing system. So if you see uh, Haskell's typing system, it's very powerful and people love it for it. Um, as Python users, we don't always uh, like typing systems, especially like when I'm writing Java, I'm like, oh my God, kill me because so verbose, right? But typing systems do have this very neat property that most of your bugs are caught in static analysis in your IDE before you even run the code. So that's quite neat. Like you don't want bugs or especially typing bugs to go to production, right? That happens all the time in Python. 
So you see Python has also added support for typing using type hints. They don't enforce it in the compiler, but they do uh, you know, let stuff like PyLance and VS Code uh, use it as uh, type checkers and linters and so on. And it has caused like uh, big bucks for me and it's very satisfying. Even in the JavaScript world, you see stuff, stuff like TypeScript being all the rage these days because it's uh, catching so many things in, in static analysis, right? The last thing, hopefully, about uh, functional programming is you get free speed up, free parallelization. Functional programming, if you think about it really, is inherently parallel because there's no state, right? So let's take an example right in Python, right? Um, say I have a list of devices and I have one function called infcon that takes only one device. Now I can just use map on it and suddenly however many cores I have or however many devices I have, that many processes I have. Like the entire program was functional. I did not think about parallelization anyway and I just used this part and then now suddenly it's parallel. And that is really helpful in today's world of you know, containers and Kubernetes where, where we want to scale up and scale down in demand. And especially if you're using serverless uh, stuff like AWS Lambdas or Azure Functions or whatever, this is a really powerful idea. And uh, yeah, this is what made me fall in love with functional programming because I could suddenly like scale up my functions as much as I wanted. Uh, one problem I had in Dallas was every day I was dealing with uh, in the order of 10 terabyte of data and it was taking too much time because my program was inherently functional, uh, inherently parallel. I could just, uh, you know, spin up more uh, serverless functions and suddenly I could get everything done however fast I wanted. If I wanted to get it done in 30 minutes, so be it. If I wanted to get it done in five minutes, just throw added more functions, right? Just chop it up more partition enough more. So that was quite neat. Um, so uh, almost running out of time, but some benefits and gotchas of functional programming, you've already seen the benefits. It's easy to read because it's super concise. Um, it's easy to test because there's no integration tests involved, at least for most of the program. Everything is, you can just unit test it. Uh, that's also super nice. As someone who, has, who doesn't have a shit ton of experience in, in the industry, Testing is something I struggle with. And because uh, I write most of my programs in functional way, I can just unit test them, which is super neat. It's easy to maintain and debug. Take it from me. I've uh, maintained and debugged functional programs that I've written myself or refactored to a functional way myself. It's really easy. And if you have a mathematical mind, it is super elegant, right? Um, now, again, tongue in cheek way in, in, uh, to say that it's not all roses. So if you have code written in Haskell, it's guaranteed to have no side effects because nobody will run it, right? Of course, um, again, taken from XKCD. Um, uh, but I, I wanna uh, drive home this point. So this is quick sort. Everyone uh, of you should know what quick sort is. It's a very popular uh, analog and sorting algorithm. This is in Python. The same quick sort algorithm in Haskell is only that long, right? And it's not even that unreadable. Like this is a list comprehension and all of you know what the list comprehension is. This is a list comprehension and the whole thing is one list comprehension with a concat on top. So it's very concise and very elegant, but I won't say it's readable. So one example is when I first learned uh, functional programming or the first few weeks, I, I said, okay, if you want to learn a programming language, uh, write Conway's Game of Life in it. Um, and so I wrote Conway's Game of Life and it's super short. Uh, the rest of it is just IO code, but it's just 10 lines, right? But you can see it's not really readable. Like I, I cropped it off because it got super unreadable and super long. So uh, the, the summary of, of this lesson is, you know, just because it's functional doesn't mean it's readable. You know, tying it back to what I said at the start of the talk, the main uh, idea I want to get across is we write programs for other humans to read. So don't write programs like this. So some of the gotchas of functional programming is, uh, you know, stateful programming is hard. 
uh, as you've seen, it's not impossible because Redux does it to uh, handle state in the front end. Uh, so it's not impossible, but it's, it is quite hard if you're working always with state machines. Uh, computers that are non-functional, that's, we just don't have functional computers at all now. Uh, you know, it's registers, memories, and states all everywhere. So something we have to live with. Uh, the terminology can be a bit off-putting, but hopefully with, you know, if, if you get enough experience, you start understanding what you need to understand and just put away the rest of it. And it can be slow if you do not know what you're doing. So one thing is when you're doing dynamic programming in your algorithms class, you remember how you're memoizing uh, results and then just using it uh, after that. So if you write a factorial 100, you're probably memoizing it in an array. In functional programming, you can't do that. So if you run factorial 100 twice, you have to calculate it twice because there is no state. Of course, there are workarounds for that in some languages. Uh, like some languages really let you use impure stuff, but some don't. Um, so I guess before I end this talk, I want to give you an idea of what functional programming is in real life, uh, because even when we're doing this class in university, a lot of students just ask, Hey, this looks too theoretical. This looks too mathematical, never would work in the real world. So two examples of it is, uh, child.tech, uh, they actually moved to F sharp, uh, and a fully functional framework like a uh, few months back. And they're actually doing quite good. Uh, apparently from this Y Combinator post, they say that it's been a difficult first few months, but after that, the ROI is completely worth it. Another very famous company that does this kind of stuff is Jane Street. Uh, FinTech company does uh, high frequency trading, I believe, but their entire stack is in OCaml, uh, if I, if I remember correctly, which is a functional programming language. Uh, so yeah, that's quite neat. Uh, so personally, uh, when I was in, I, I just learned functional programming, like say six months back, but before that, uh, start of 2020, I was in Talis and I was given a big module to extend. And it was so unreadable because it wasn't written by a software engineer. Um, that I needed two or three weeks just to understand what's going on in the program. No documentation. I had to reach out to people in the company, pick their brains about why there was this edge case and why everything was so messy. Uh, and it was, of course, an uh, object oriented, it was written in an object oriented fashion. So I kept it in an OOP uh, paradigm, but most of it was functional by the time I was done with it. And uh, even in Clinify, one of the first projects I had was with one of the oldest microservices in the company, uh, written in a rush as happens in, in startups. And it was, it was just barely functioning, you know? I had to uh, extend it and I decided, hey, it's uh, the first thing I should do is make it as functional as possible and then it will be easy to maintain. And that's what's happened over the past two uh, months. I've been maintaining that piece of code, extending it, debugging it, and it's been um, a joy to maintain. So a few tips I will give you uh, when you're starting out with functional programming is try and refactor one of your existing services um, and do it bottom up, right? So the smallest functions, take them, make them completely functional and then work your way up, right? And you'll be refactoring a lot, rewriting the same thing over and over again as you gain experience. Um, Another thing is not everything has to be functional. Like I am a practical person. I'm not a functional fanatic. Like everything you do has to be functional. What usually ends up happening is you hit a point of diminishing returns. So the Pareto principle, the 80-20 principle, you see that uh, most of your functions, most of your program, if you think about it, you can make it uh, functional. And once you start doing that, you can see all the quirks of your architecture and you can really decouple everything together and make it nice and maintainable. But the very top level is often dealing with IO, is often dealing with servers, requests and stuff. That part often is, is not worth making functional. Like even OCaml, uh, like Haskell, even IO in Haskell is um, functional because they use this thing called monads which I'm not a big fan of, but OCaml decided, hey, you know what? Like 
this IO is always going to be impure. We're just going to document the fact that this is impure. Treat it as impure. Don't do a lot of IO, but the rest of it make functional. So uh, I suggest that kind of approach to your refactoring as well. Um, and again, tying it back to the first uh, slide of the talk is emphasize readability because that's what this is about. And finally, be patient. Uh, one of the things I notice when I'm refactoring an existing microservice or even my own code is say I have a function 10 levels down, which needs one parameter. Uh, and it's super easy to just call self dots whatever to conjure that parameter and modify it. Because the alternative is those 10 levels down, keep passing it as a parameter, like the same thing, parameter, 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 and nobody's using it except the bottom level. Uh, yeah, you just have to be patient because it is worth it, trust me. Lots of parameter passing, but it's worth it. So yeah, that, that's about it. Uh, right now I want to give you, a, hopefully I've inspired you and give you, given you the basic framework of mind needed to go in and dive in. Uh, so the first thing I would like to point you to is learn you a Haskell. Uh, this is a free online super book that you should read uh, if you want to learn functional programming. I would say start with a pure functional program programming uh, language like Haskell because it won't let you do hacks and really you have to understand what's going on. After that, you can take it out and use something like OCaml or even Python, JavaScript, whatever, and take those principles to your existing uh, non-functional language. Another very good um, thing, uh, resource is Python's own documentation about functional languages uh, in, in Python 3. So uh, definitely check it out if you're a Python programmer. Uh, one of the most highly recommended resources I'd give you is this blog post by John Carmack, who is the CTO of Oculus at Facebook. Uh, you know, the gaming, the VR headset. He writes about functional programming in the gaming industry, which is like unheard of in C++. He talks about, it, it's a long article, but he talks about why even in that kind of industry, functional programming is really strong and helpful for him. And he talks about the kind of like the Pareto principle of where the diminishing returns are and why uh, even in that industry, he thinks functional programming has a lot of value. So I think uh, you'll find a lot of uh, value in this. And well, apart from that, I'm, I'm done with my time and thank you very much. I'll open the floor to questions and uh, yeah, you can reach out to me here if you'd like to talk more about functional programming. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sai. That was super resourceful and insightful because I myself was wondering how AWS serverless actually scales because I just write the function and that's it. I see that it's scaling automatically like on demand and you clarified that. Thanks so much for that. Uh, we have a bunch of questions. First of all, uh, is could you please explain how higher order functions maintain immutability? Right. Um, sure. So going back to this, uh, this slide, yeah, it's not that higher order functions maintain immutability. It's more that higher, it, it's higher order functions was a side note to the fact that immu uh, this is how we do immutable programming when we need for loops, right? Uh, so you, you see, if you go back to the first slide or something of my talk, you see this uh, thing about higher order functions, right? And everyone, uh, you know, the first thing you hear is in functional languages, functions are first class citizens and you have higher order functions. Nobody knows what that means. So the point about higher order functions in my talk was that it's nothing super uh, difficult. It's just that one function taking in another function as a parameter, that's all. Thank you. This might be a silly question from my side, but I was just wondering, you showed the example of map or reduce in, that, in, in Python. I was wondering, doesn't filter or map themselves implement uh, the function with for loops? Doesn't it implement? Ah, so see, uh, the, at the very basic level, 
a computer, uh, you know, we have registers and stuff and we have assembly uh, languages and they do have constructs like for loops, right? The point about functional programming and a functional paradigm is that it abstracts those icky bits away from the programmer and you work in a more higher order uh, nature. So you don't think about the icky bits like for loops and stuff. Um, recently, I've written uh, this article about Prolog, uh, which is uh, programming languages for uh, a programming languages for puzzle, which is like completely declarative. You can also think about SQL as a language. It's a declarative language. You don't really have for loops in SQL, right? But when you're giving that um, SQL statement to a database, what does it do? It does scan through it in a for loopish way, right? So the point about it is you don't write for loops. You don't worry about the implementation details. Uh, one thing we uh, see when we, it's kind of a mantra in, in functional programming. Uh, if you notice all my, uh, all my statements, functional statements is that in a functional language, in a procedure language, you tell the computer what to do, like go through it for loop by, uh, you know, in a for loop, do this and then do that and then do that. In a functional paradigm, you tell the program what the result is. So you say here, the result is a filtered version of this uh, list. So you tell it what it is instead of what to do and the computer will take care of what to do itself. So yeah, uh, completely valid point. The computer does a for loop, you don't do a for loop, yeah. That's a totally different way of thinking. Definitely, yeah. That's why I say that if you learn functional programming, it makes you a very, like personally over the last six months as a programmer, I've grown a lot because of functional programming because it's a completely different way of thinking. Like everyone in the stock, even if you don't end up using functional programming languages or even functional programming in your in your day-to-day -day work, it'll really make you a very good programmer because you can think in many different ways. Okay, there's one more question. Um, is Haskell statically typed? Uh, the questionnaire do doesn't know about Haskell. Being statically typed and being functional sure. are mutually exclusive, right? Oh, no, 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 it's, it's, it's not mutually exclusive. Haskell is statically typed. Um, it has a very, let's see, what is a non-statically typed function? can't think of one, but like I said, in most functional languages, you see a very strong type system. Haskell is statically typed. The nice thing about Haskell is you don't have to tell it what type everything is. So if you're writing in C, you say int x equals five. You have to tell C it's an int, but in Haskell, you don't. You just say let x equals five. It will figure itself out uh, what type it is, depending on what functions you're using on it. Of course, you can also force it to be some type, uh, but that's a different matter altogether. That's a matter of preference. So yeah, Haskell is uh, statically typed, but you don't have to write everything. What is the performance stat between a map and a for loop? Uh, excellent question. If you are Paralyzing your own for loop. Uh, excellent question by Omar. Uh, if you're paralyzing your own for loop, I don't think there should be a very big difference. But if you're not paralyzing your own for loops, you are at the mercy of the caching algorithm in hardware and software. So in that sense, I think map might be um, map might be faster. Let me see. performance difference of map versus for. I think I've seen an article somewhere. Uh, yeah, so there are quite a few articles about this uh, on Medium as well. You can you can take a look. Um, almost, all, I've never seen map be slow, slower than for loops for me. 
yeah, at max, it will be sl as slow as for loop. So uh, there's really no reason to use for uh, if, if I'm familiar with for. Yeah. I was just wondering, yeah. how do you understand that what paradigm to use when you're solving a problem? Like, is it intuition or you, you think through procedural language, you th think through declarative language, you think through functional it's, language? It's, it's a really uh, interesting question. Um, I haven't figured it out yet. Um, because I've learned functional programming over the past uh, year, I really do have a strong inclination to code in a functional way, but not use functional languages. Uh, so I usually go for uh, Swiss knife language like Python, because you can do OOP in Python. You can do uh, procedural language, uh, procedural code in Python. You can do functional code in Python. So I usually go for a, for a Swiss army knife like Python or JavaScript. Um, if you're, uh, it depends on your paradigm. So say right now I'm making another robot. Making robots in functional ways is not possible because when we're doing uh, robotics, we are doing something called bare metal programming, where you really have to control each register on the microcontroller. So at that point, uh, forget about functional programming, make it as functional as you want, but you will do non-functional things in your C code or C++ code max. Uh, when I'm solving puzzles, uh, I'd probably use Prolog if I can. Uh, I'm not very comfortable with it, but I would. If you're working with a database, you would probably use an SQL-like language, if not SQL itself. Um, so yeah, it's not an exclusive choice. You can use a language of your preference and see whether which parts to make functional and which parts to make object-oriented. Uh, like I said, for both the microservices I was talking about, both had a lot of configuration and a lot of flavors running at the same time. So I had to make it uh, object oriented. So it was an object oriented program in Python, but most of it was not using, was using explicit parameter passing to keep it as functional as possible. Um, again, as you gain experience, I guess I will also understand which paradigm to hold for, but uh, right now my preference is always take a Swiss army knife and code in as functional as possible. Um, would you recommend mixing up of uh, functional paradigm and pro procedural language paradigm? Uh, recommend uh, mixing up of them? Yeah. Uh, I think it's inevitable at some point. Uh, even in OCaml, like I said, uh, I've not read or written a lot of OCaml, uh, but what I usually see is the top level, the very top level, or even if you're doing something in Flask, the very top level is kind of procedural, but after that, it gets as functional as possible. What I will say is do not make a code seem functional, but do procedural stuff inside. So what I tend to do is if I really cannot avoid uh, making it procedural, I have a big comment on top of the function saying, this is impure code, please read carefully, right? And we often find most bugs there. So uh, it, it's worth it to not, like I said, do not trick the user into thinking this is functional code, but write procedural code. If it's functional, keep it functional. If it's not functional, say it's procedural. And that's often good enough for most of your use cases. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I find some similarities with hardware description languages. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with HDLs. Uh, I've done some, what do you call it? Uh, FPGA programming in Vivaldo and stuff, not a fan. Uh, so I really can't comment. But yeah, uh, from what I remember, most of it was declarative as well. Uh, so yeah, it, it's very similar. Yeah, also at the same time, I think since parally parallelization comes very naturally to functional language, I think it has a bright future because everything is turning distributed systems. What, yeah, what yeah, everything's turning to real systems. Uh, I think that's gonna be a. I think that's part of the reason there's a hype. Uh, and yeah, if, if it's a good hype, sure, I'll take it. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're completely right there. Awesome. Does anyone have any more questions? Hey, feel I, free to unmute yourselves and and put in the chat or put in the chat. Um, 
or if, if you have questions later on in the day, just ping me on LinkedIn or something and I'll be happy to help. Yeah. Yeah, Saif is very resourceful. Feel free to reach out to him and uh, hopefully Saif will give us access to his slides so you can take a look at them. Go for yeah. a second word. Let me do that now. You know what? Uh, I'll take it from you and then I'll post it. Uh, sure. In a, okay. Sure, and sure. Thank you so much for this awesome talk. It's the first day of the week and we just kicked off with a very good workshop series and it feels very, it feels very good to learn about functional programming from you. Thank you okay. for your time, Saif. Well, thank you so much. It's been an honor. Yeah. Have fun, guys.